Thanks, Nikki. Very nice to be here again and um, to talk about the topic of community health workers. So um, we have an hour and a half. There's a lot to get through. So just to give you an overview, um, I'm going to start with the history of community health workers. And then we're going to have some discussion around the factors that influence the success um, and the challenges in especially large-scale community health worker programs. We're then going to look at the evidence for the effectiveness of community health workers, both in terms of prevention, but also more recently in the push towards curative services provided by community health workers. And we'll end with a video um, which shows um, uh, something about the community health worker program in Ethiopia. Okay, so I want to hear from you first of all, what, um, what is your understanding of community health workers? How would you define a community health worker? There's lots of different terms used in the literature for them. Lay health workers, close to community providers, um, volunteer health workers. So in essence, what are they? Okay. So they, they're close to the people that they're providing services to. Okay. Anything else? Right. So not professionally trained. Yeah. Any any other definitions that you've heard of? Yes. Right. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So there um there is sort of a, a link between communities and health services. Right, and they've had some kind of training. So the, the World Health Organization definition is any health worker carrying out functions related to healthcare delivery, as you said, with some form of training, but no formal professional uh, or paraprofessional certified education. And they can either be paid or voluntary. So what kind of services do you think should be delivered by community health workers? Or where can they best play a role in terms of providing care? Screening. Health promotion. Education. Counseling on. Adherence counseling, yeah. Right. HIV AIDS counseling. Yes. Data collection. Yeah. So kind of surveillance work in a way. Yeah. Follow up and adherence. Yes. Referrals. Right. Doulas, um, yeah, so traditional birth attendants are often referred to as lay health workers, or a part of the, the collective of uh, community health workers providing delivery support. So um, we know that um, even, even in parts of South Africa, uh, we have very rural areas where access to services um, can be difficult, either um, because of um, distances, um, because of uh, transport issues. So we need that, that is one of the justifications for having services um, delivered by community providers. Um, we know that um, many effective interventions, particularly um, preventive ones, breastfeeding, uh, immunizations beyond the, the, the early ones, um, the coverage is low, even though these services are part of our primary healthcare package. Um, 
I've mentioned transport and financial barriers that could prevent people from traveling to uh, fixed site facilities for care. And um, in South Africa and particularly in um, sub-Saharan African countries, there is a shortage of skilled health providers, particularly nurses, um, for the provision of primary health care services. So I think, um, as it was mentioned, community health workers really do form a link between our primary health care facilities, fixed sites, and, and communities. And that's an important aspect of their role. So community health workers have been around for many years. And um, the concept was originally described and, 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 and discussed at the Alma Arta Conference on Primary Healthcare. And I, I see some handouts about it, so I'm sure you've covered it in your course. Um, and at the Alma Arta Conference, there was um, principles discussed around primary healthcare, one of which was the role of community participation. And so um, having a, a cadre of people from within communities being trained to provide health services is one aspect of bringing healthcare closer to communities and then involving them um, in their own healthcare. And so after the Alma Ata conference, a number of countries started investing in and developing community health worker programs. And um, there were a large number of national programs developed as well, particularly in Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, in, in countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So um, these programs were developed, but there really wasn't a lot of experience or evidence to guide um, the best implementation of these programs. So, so should the workers be voluntary? Should they be paid? What kind of catchment populations would be reasonable? What kind of services should they be delivering? And so they were implemented and rapidly scaled up without, um, uh, without really evidence to guide uh, the programs. And so um, the effectiveness of these programs was questioned and they started to be evaluations undertaken to see whether they were actually having any impact. And, and the evaluations found a lot of difficulties and challenges in these community health worker programs. And, um, many of those difficulties described in the 1980s, we're still seeing today. And so they're still very relevant. So I would like to go into some detail about them. But I'm sure a group such as yourselves has some idea about what the challenges could be um, in implementing community health worker program or what uh, the success factors that might influence a program. Anybody got any ideas? Right. Mm -mm. So you raised, uh, I think, two important points. One is around the size of the catchment area. So if it's extremely large, it's impossible for the community health worker to really stay close and in touch with the families and, and to, to travel to reach everybody. And then secondly, the equipment and supplies that they, that they require to, to carry out their functions. Um, let's take one more comment and then we will um, go through some of these issues um, and give some evidence for them. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm, mm, mm. Very good point, yes. The relationship of community health workers with professional health workers is a very important factor in the success of programs. Okay, so you've mentioned really, I think, all of these things. Um, how community health workers are selected, whether they're selected by their community or through a, a more formal process, training that they undertake, um, the support and supervision that they receive, drugs and supplies, we mentioned from Zimbabwe, um, infrastructure, the equipment that they, they need to carry out their functions, transport, 
and their links and, and relationship with the community that they are serving. Um, there are political factors also at play, um, whether, whether this is a national government policy or whether it's something that's really happening sporadically in a country. Um, incentives were mentioned, uh, whether these are salaried or volunteer workers. And then the last point was around the relationship with formal health workers. Oops. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, the, the roles and functions need to be absolutely clear so that the formal, the nurses in the clinic understand what is reasonably, can be expected of a community health worker and the community health worker is clear on what services they're meant to be delivering so that there isn't sort of a higher level of expectation as you describe or more tasks being given than than, than the training um, really prepared somebody for. So that's also critical. We seem to have just lost the slides, but hopefully they'll be back soon. So um, I think the first issue was around selection. And there are various approaches to selection. I think that, um, you know, in the original... Uh, concept of community health workers in, at the Alma Ata conference, the, the idea was that community health workers should be selected and chosen by the community that they're going to serve, that they are close to the community, live within the community and are chosen because of certain values um, and that they are there, therefore respected by, um, by their communities. And um, I'm going to use an example from Malawi because um, this is an interesting um, setting where historically uh, there have been community health workers for a number of years, but the country decided to formalize the program and to develop a national program of health surveillance assistance. And when the program became a national program, they decided that for... Um, issues of employment equity and fairness, that the recruitment process should be centralized. So the Ministry of Health actually places formal adverts for community health workers. And uh, I think now it has been um, decentralized to, to district level. Um, but you have to apply and you're interviewed and you're recruited. But a so the majority, actually, of the HSAs that are hired are hired and uh, deployed to areas other than where they live. So they need to move with their whole family to another part of the country to set up their health post and, and to start work as a community health worker. And so these are government positions. They're uh, part of the health workforce and they're salaried. Um, but it's become a very formalized recruitment process. And this was one of the countries that we visited for a, a multi-country evaluation of community health workers. And we found that only 36% of the villages in Malawi actually have an HSA that's living there. So they, they, they know that they have an HSA and that, that he's responsible, they're, they're largely male, uh, for, for that community, but because that person actually lives somewhere else and was employed to work in a different area. They travel in and out. So they use taxis or buses and only actually come to their communities a few times a week. And so that is the situation where the recruitment has been taken away from communities and made uh, to be a very formalized national process. I'm not sure if there are other countries that have adopted that approach. Um, but this is something which is really um, under debate in Malawi because it's a fantastic program, very well, well resourced and um, very much within government policy. But uh, you know, the reality on the ground is that communities are sitting without an HSA because they didn't come from that area. Um, training, there's been a lot published about um, the fact that it isn't sufficient to, tr to do an initial training of community health workers and then deploy them 
and expect that to last for their essentially their their working career. Um, just as nurses and doctors need refresher training and you know ongoing updates, so do community health workers. And um, some a, a recent systematic review published in Health Policy and Planning just at the end of last year has shown that. Um, Ongoing training really has an impact on motivation and it makes sense obviously also on performance, but um, that without that ongoing refresher training that skills and knowledge are lost and, and really within one year of receiving initial training. So it would make sense that um, to have a well-functioning community health worker program, ideally you want to have a well-functioning health system at higher levels so that you have an efficient referral uh, process available, you have functioning clinics that you can ref that the community health worker can, can refer people to, that um, they have sufficient supplies and resources and transport. But the reality is in most cases where community health workers are really needed, it is because the health systems are weak. And so they have a really important role to play uh, and they are critical even where the uh, supportive structures are not there. Um, and there's also evidence to show that without a, a process of integrating and linking community health workers to the next level in the health service, um, their success is, is really hampered. So um, support and supervision is something which has really been described since the very first community health worker programs as being often the weakest and um, the, the aspect that receives the least attention. Um, in many programs, supervision is assumed to be the responsibility of the next level of health worker, which is often nurses within clinics. Um, but nurses already have a whole string of tasks and functions, and they are largely facility-based. Um, and so the transport to, to go out to supervise is often not available, or it could be a time constraint also. You wanted to make a comment? Oh. Um, so supervision is critical, but I'll show, uh, I'll show you evidence from, from the six countries we looked at, um, that even now um, it's, it's, it's still a very weak component. So, so we looked at um, six countries, Ghana, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Malawi, Mali, and Niger. And the dark blue bar show, oops, uh, shows whether a community health worker was supervised in the previous three months. And the light blue bar is whether that supervision included observation of their clinical skills. Because in these countries, community health workers are able to diagnose and treat children uh, for malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea. So they have kits with um, antibiotics, oral rehydration solution, and um, artemisinin-based combination treatment for malaria. So you can imagine that training uh, essentially a, a lay health worker to treat children needs to be accompanied by very close supervision and, um, and clinical supervision. So in these countries, uh, just over half um, of the community health workers had, had any supervision in the previous three months, any contact with a supervisor. Um, and just to point out the way that this information is collected, so, so M&E systems are another important part of community health worker programs. And it's often um, a, a, an additional task for the community health worker to keep lots of paper records and carry them around and submit them at the end of every month. So um, in Mozambique, what they did was they, the, the central district office would phone their community health workers every month and say, when did you last see your supervisor? And um, so... We really don't believe that about 98% of them had seen their supervisor. And so this also um, makes you think that inf information like this needs to be critically assessed. Um, 
and that a, a telephonic survey, when all the other countries are way down around 50%, really needs to spark some suspicion. Um, and, um, and then when it comes to um, clinical supervision, where a supervisor actually was present when a community health worker was treating a child, was assessing and treating a child, um, and um, very, very, very low in Ghana and around half. Uh, this was also through telephonic survey in Mozambique. Um, so, so very low supervision. And, and this is a high-level function that's being devolved and task shifted to a community health worker. And it's very worrying that, um, that the supervision is as infrequent as it is. So um, a colleague from Zimbabwe mentioned um, supplies and logistics. So, so this is a bicycle that was being ridden by a community health worker in Ghana. You really wouldn't want to sit on that and travel anywhere. Um, often bicycles are given out when somebody is hired to the job and it's just expected to last the duration of their employment. But we all know that you need tires and you need uh, spares and... Um, and so these things need to, need to be factored in to programs. Um, it's not a once-off expense. Um, other things which we were told about during our uh, visits, boots for walking around, particularly in the rainy season when it's very muddy, an umbrella, a torch for doing visits at night, um, and a kit bag. So these are all the kinds of equipment that a community health worker needs to perform their task properly, and it's often the things that are given once off and never again and, and not taken into account as regular requirements. Um, I'm going to give another example here from Malawi of the link between the community health workers and another structure. Um, in South Africa, we often call a clinic health committees. Um, they're called village health committees in Malawi. And there's a special relationship between the village health committees and the community health workers. And this is what um, a member of the village health committee said to us. So these people, they have a wooden drug box, and the drug box has two lockable keys. One key is kept by a member of the village health committee. Why? Um, you know the, the HSA... They, they can see that the village health committee member is required to assist members of the community at any time, even at night or during the day, um, to avoid abuse. So they are an accountability mechanism so that they prevent the community health worker from abusing the, the supply of drugs. It's, it's a mechanism whereby somebody else has a key. Um, so when I see a child come any other day, other than the scheduled clinic days, and this is because, as I've mentioned, in Malawi, the community health workers travel in and out mostly. So they have certain days of the week that they're there in the community, other days when they're not. And so uh, a message is sent on a mobile phone because most of the people have mobile phones and it says, I have a patient and bring the other key. Help so I can assist children at night, it is the same. And for the safety, which is a, a big issue in South Africa for community health workers, um, for the safety of the community health worker, particularly at night, you have some member of the village health committee that accompanies them when they need to see um, somebody at home. People will just come and attack him. So a member of the village health committee is informed and has one key to make sure that we have safety and proper support. So that's a very formalized link between the community health worker. Essentially, any, any um, treatment that he needs to give, um, the, a member of the village health committee accompanies him and is with him at his health post every time he's there. So we also heard mention of the link between community health workers and formal health workers, and um, particularly when it comes to uh, higher level tasks like treatment. So um, uh, a good example here is Ethiopia. So Ethiopia has um, what's called a health extension program, so it's a, again, it's a national level policy to provide services at community level through what they call health extension workers. And Ethiopia wanted to, because it's, it's um, 
large parts of the country are very rural with no kind of uh, primary health care facilities near, nearby to many villages. And so they wanted to try and push for their health extension workers to treat children. And there was an um, attempt to pass a law to enable the health extension workers to use antibiotics to treat children with pneumonia. And the Ethiopian Pediatric Association blocked this because they felt that certainly community health workers shouldn't be having antibiotics and they shouldn't be treating children. And it took um, about two years with lots of lobbying. And in fact, uh, the medical association went and visited uh, programs in India to see how they were functioning. Uh, there were lobbying visits by UNICEF and eventually they um, came around and, and the law was passed, but it, was, um, it really delayed the, the start of this um, program by a number of years. So we've heard um, from the Winelands area that um, financial incentives are um, a critical factor in, in community health worker programs. And lack of regular payment, which is common, because often salaries are being provided through grants and donor funding, and they're not uh, not often um, government uh, um, salaries, um, regular payrolls. So they can be irregularly paid. Um, in volunteer programs, so um, Ghana is one example where the community health workers are all volunteers. Um, people have to have other livelihood activities, and I think... Um, is it your name? I can't see it there. Yes, you mentioned uh, in Zimbabwe that Dorcas, um, that um, the community health workers also need to have their own livelihood activities. Uh, if they're not being paid, they may have farmlands, they may have little shops um, to, to generate their own income. But uh, the, the, the systematic review I mentioned, which was just published, also um, describes the importance of non-financial incentives, which um, could include things like having the respect of your community and trust, uh, recognition, uh, personal career development, opportunities for training and, um, and advancement, that these are also very important to help with motivation and um, performance and retention in programs. So many um, community health worker programs aspire to volunteerism, the idea that people want to help their communities and they will do that for no financial gain. Um, but the evidence <coughs> that we've generated from, from the countries where community health workers are voluntary is that the, the utilization of them is often low and for reasons, for a number of reasons. One, that they have to do other tasks and functions for their own livelihood, so they're not as available as somebody who was perhaps employed full-time. Um, not being salaried and employed in some way can also influence com the community's trust and respect um, and um, their um, yeah, understanding of the role and, and trust in their skills and abilities. So... Um, and then also high turnover, because obviously if somebody finds a job that's paid, they're going to give up their voluntary work. Um, and so just to give you some idea of the issues, in the, 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 the macro issues with um, costs of volunteer programs. So obviously there, there are costs involved in having a community health worker, even if they're voluntary. Um, there, there's training, there's, they need kits, uh, they need to be supervised. Um, and these costs are, are fixed costs. So in, irrespective of whether they see two people a day or 10 people a day, those costs are fixed. So if in one program, if, so if, if it costs $100 per month, for instance, per CHW, in, in one country, let's say this is Malawi, they see 200 children um, per month. And in um, 
sorry, that's per year. 200 children per year, and in, um, let's say, Ghana, they see 10. Ultimately, the cost per child that they see is $0.7 in Malawi and $10 in Ghana. So even in a volunteer program, it's actually more expensive to run because of those other issues that I've mentioned. And so when community health workers are volunteers, there's often a less focus on their optimal deployment because they, people think they're free. So uh, why don't we just have three per community? You know, let's just have more of them because we're not really paying for them. But as I've said, they still need to be trained, they still need equipment, and they still need to be supervised. And these costs still need to be taken into account. And um, obviously volunteers can't spend all of their time on this and they need to generate income in other ways. Um, and so th these are just some of the more higher level policy issues that need to be taken into account when planning for a community health worker program. Okay, are there any questions regarding some of those issues of um, what are the success factors? Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, so, I mean, CHWs are very much um, the flavor of the month at the moment. Um, there's um, a number of big initiatives. Um, the, the One Million Community Health Workers for Africa initiative. Um, there's a website that you can look at there. Um, there's a real um, belief that community health workers are what's going to push us towards the post-2015 goals. Um, but we, we need to not replicate these lessons learned from the past. And um, examples of, of really successful programs um, would be Ethiopia, countries where um, there's been high-level government commitment and endorsement of the approach, which is then translated into um, uh, government funding for, for basics like salaries and training. Um, and I'll show you now um, evidence from the six countries, um, how the programs are financed. Um, and really, for, it, for, for, for these to be sustainable, it has to be a government-owned and a, a government-funded program. So Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Brazil, um, Malawi, apart from the selection and recruitment issues, um, are all examples of programs which really are having an impact. And um, we're starting to see evidence, really high-quality evidence of... You know, I think um, in Malawi, it's, um, the HSAs are really, um, I think they're, they're, they're seen less as lay health workers because they've been trained, I think, uh, what do they get? Three months of full-time training plus additional training for their curative functions. And um, they, they, they're able to dispense drugs. They work out of, they don't work door to door like many programs, they have a fixed health post, like a mini clinic. So they're seen as um, professionalized in a way. Um, and they have clinic times and clinic schedules. So it, it's different from a, a very much um, lay volunteer model where somebody's going door to door and screening at household level. In Malawi, they rely on the village health committee and a layer of volunteers in different aspects, in, in health promotion, in nutrition. So there is a layer below the HSAs that do more of the door-to-door -door screening. And the HSA is really based in a clinic. Um, they, dis they, they diagnose and they dispense medication. They also spend time within clinics. So they, they are rostered to spend time within clinics. And so it's, it's a more professionalized role there. And... and um, perhaps a step further away from close to community. Um, David. You know, in a number of countries, uh, Ghana, Ethiopia, 
India, um, you can buy antibiotics at the corner store. You don't need a prescription. Um, so um, essentially providing training to somebody to accurately assess and diagnose is a better option than somebody going and, and, and buying it themselves and, and possibly treating um, unnecessarily. Um, you had a comment first. <laughs> okay, let's move on because um, there's lots of interesting discussion, but I just want to get to to the end of the, the slides and then we can hopefully have some more time. So in the 1990s um, and beyond, there's been renewed interest in community health workers for a number of reasons. Firstly, the HIV AIDS epidemic came and suddenly there was a crisis in how are we going to test and how are we going to support adherence for for this growing e epidemic and affected population. So community health workers um, have been used to, to do voluntary counselling and testing as lay counsellors, to, um, to do um, home-based adherence support, both for HIV as well as for TB. Um, there's um, also a growing non-communicable disease um, uh, epidemics with um, hypertension and diabetes and Community health workers are also being used for adherence support for um, non-communicable and chronic, other chronic illnesses. Um, there's also been more focus on decentralizing health services and um, devolving functions to, um, to district level for, for planning and monitoring of services and then incorporating a community-based uh, layer, often with um, NGOs and CBOs being responsible for certain services. Um, the human resource crisis um, is another factor, as well as pressure to reach the MDG goals. So um, community health workers have been seen as a, as a way particularly for countries to accelerate progress towards the fourth millennium development goal through largely um, high impact interventions. So trying to improve breastfeeding, community-based nutrition support, increasing coverage of immunizations and those kind of high-impact interventions. So um, we have described task shifting, and that's really come about um, as a policy um, due to the human resource crisis and, and looking at ways to devolve activities and functions from one level of um, health worker to another. And it can be from doctors to mid-level workers. In Malawi, there are um, mid-level workers who can actually perform cesarean sections, and other um, uh, surgical procedures, um, but then also from nurses to a more lay uh, or community level of, of staff. So I think we did um, discuss this at the beginning. Um, so at community level, there are a wide range of tasks and functions that um, can be delivered. Um, we've spoken about healthy behaviors, hand washing, um, lobbying for improved water, water supply. Um, there's an initiative called Community-Led um, Total Sanitation, whereby communities lobby for um, improved um, toilet facilities. Um, and then other preventive interventions like vitamin A and deworming of children. More complex tasks in South Africa, in... Uh, Five years ago, policy was changed, allowing um, community health workers to perform finger prick testing um, for, um, for HIV, um, um, performing uh, rapid HIV tests. Um, so that's currently um, uh, been legalized, but in most cases, community health workers are only performing the testing within clinics and facilities. There is very little door-to-door. -door. In fact, our community health workers are not allowed to do testing within households, even though the law does allow for it. Um, community case management, what David was talking about, is where community health workers are able to diagnose and treat malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea. And in India and Ethiopia, also neonatal sepsis. 
um, and malnutrition. Um, and then there's also uh, the sort of more um, community change agents and mobilization um, for, for a, a variety of um, being, being advocates for improved health services. So some of the evidence. Um, there have been very rigorous Cochrane systematic reviews which have pulled together the evidence um, largely from Southeast Asia where the, the, the longer standing community health worker programs have been um, in place. Um, but looking at the evidence for clinical impact. And um, so community health workers have been shown to improve uptake of immunization, um, breastfeeding, initiation, any breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding, almost threefold improved rate of exclusive breastfeeding with community health workers, as well as uh, TB cure rates. Um, there's also been um, a meta-analysis where they pulled together and, and reanalyzed the data from a number of trials, um, showing that um, there was a 24% mortality reduction from pneumonia case management. And this was amongst neonates, infants, and preschool children. And then in Ethiopia, um, training mothers to give um, home anti-malarials resulted in a 40% reduction in under five mortality. So um, I will make these slides available so that you can access the references if you want to, to look them up. Similarly for diarrhea, um, there have been systematic reviews looking specifically at the impact of community health workers treating children with diarrhea. And in, in pneumonia, there was a 20% reduction in infant mortality from community health worker treatment of pneumonia and a 24% reduction in overall mortality. So as David says, we do have evidence um, from trials. What we need now is evidence from routine practice. So we know that in a clinical trial situation, um, community health workers are very effective. But in, in research settings, usually um, it's the best case scenario. So they've been well trained, they're usually being supervised, having the supplies that they needed. We need more evidence now from large scale programs to see that the same um, impact, um, to see if we can achieve the same impact. So if we look at global implementation of um, treatment and varying types of treatment by community health workers, um, UNICEF did a survey of 42 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and they found that 35 of the 42 countries um, community health workers were providing oral rehydration solution for diarrhea. In 33 countries they were treating malaria. In fewer, and this is um, virtually all due to opposition by um, particularly pediatricians and medical associations. Um, so 28, they're providing antibiotics for pneumonia. Very few are treating neonatal sepsis. Um, I mentioned Ethiopia w was one, um, but very few there. A uh, large number are allowing community health workers to assess and treat children with malnutrition. And so overall, the countries that are providing um, all three, they don't include the neonatal sepsis here, is 28. And that's up from 21 in 2010. So you can see that countries really are moving policy towards uh, a greater role and function for community health workers. And this was just published in the Journal of Global Health. But financing, and this is where the issue of um, government ownership um, of programs. Um, so payment for training. Um, in, um, amongst these countries, UNICEF was the largest funder of training for community health workers. Similarly for drugs and equipment. Uh, other major development partners are the major um, sponsors of CHW salaries. You see government, um, I think five countries, in five countries was CHW salaries being paid by governments. And then um, also other major development partners largely funding infrastructure and transport. So 
even though there is a big shift towards um, really greater roles and functions and, um, and scaling up in terms of geographic spread, um, community health workers, it is largely being donor funded. And, and that's an, an issue for sustainability. That is a health post in Ethiopia with um, health extension workers who in Ethiopia are largely women. Okay, so there's different models of delivery um, of services in community health worker programs. You have um, often a door-to-door -door approach like we have in South Africa where community health workers don't have a fixed office um, or, or many sort of consulting room, they go door to door. Uh, whereas in other countries like Ethiopia and Malawi, they have structures. Uh, often the community builds a structure for them, a, a little wooden uh, health post where they uh, run their services from. And we've already discussed some programs are paid, some are voluntary. Um, whether they focus on children or include young children or include older children and adults is also um, a difference between programs. In Mozambique, where there's been a resurgence, they had a very strong community health worker program prior to the Civil War, and that is now um, being developed and strengthened again. And they made a decision that it wouldn't be fair for the community health workers to only treat children under five, because if a mother comes with a seven-year-old, can they say, no, we just can't treat your child, she's uh, above the age limit. So actually in Mozambique, they've decided to treat adults and children um, all ages. And, and it's a unique program in that sense, because in the other countries that we visited, they were very strictly only allowed to treat children under five years of age. So the ratio of community health workers to population is also an important factor. Um, it's, Dorcas mentioned that having a very large catchment population is really going to impact on the effectiveness because you can't possibly reach everybody and know the conditions and the, and the, the problems in your community if it's very large. Um, in um, Ethiopia, they have um, quite large catchment populations as well. And um, so... If, the, if the, the catch population is large, people may also then bypass the community health worker because they're just not available enough and, and, and go to higher levels of care. Um, we've just, uh, David and I have just written something about um, programs where there are two layers, and, and this is being seen more and more, that as community health workers are more professionalized and given more tasks and functions, and are operating out of fixed facilities, that a layer below becomes more important. So um, in Ethiopia, they have what's known as the Health Development Army, which is a purely volunteer group of individuals that do more of the mobilization, the prevention and promotion aspects, um, counseling, nutrition counseling. And they, then, they are then the link between the community and the more professionalized health extension workers who, who consult out of a hut. Um, in Mali, the similar system exists, and in Niger, they're known as Relay, Relay Communitaire. And the, the challenge of giving more tasks and functions to community health workers and, and um, essentially turning them into mini nurses means that they are taken further and further away from the community and from their, the, the original spirit of the idea in Alma Arta, which was community participation and involvement in health. And so a layer below becomes critical um, because they are then the people that are doing a lot of the mobilization and the advocacy work. And um, hopefully we will have something published on this soon. Um, so... If we come back to South Africa, where can community health workers make a difference here? Well, um, in South Africa, um, the two, two of the leading causes of, of deaths in children under five are pneumonia, 17%, same um, as for HIV, now that we have a well-functioning PMTCT program. 
And diarrhea, 7% of under five deaths are due to diarrhea. So these are two conditions which in, I think, uh, 28 other African countries are being treated by community health workers. Um, another area, um, early infant diagnosis. So all the evidence tells us that in order to reduce mortality in children infected with HIV, we need to start them on antiretrovirals as soon as possible. And so our policy in South Africa allows for children to be started on treatment as soon as they are diagnosed. There's no CD4 cutoff. They need to be put onto treatment immediately. And we did a national survey in all nine provinces, and we asked mothers who knew they were HIV positive um, at a six-week clinic visit whether they were going to have their child tested at that visit. So we interviewed women at the clinic when they'd come for their six-week immunization. Less than half said they were going to have their child tested. So they knew they were HIV positive. They knew that there were services at the clinic to, to test their children. But, um, I mean, I think those of you who work in the services know issues of stigma, um, the way women are treated often in, in clinic settings. There's no privacy to discuss these issues in a big immunization um, services in clinics. So community health workers in South Africa are legally allowed to do um, pricks. Um, there is some discussion around whether that applies to children or not. It's not clear, really, uh, from the policy, and there's no real age cutoff. But somebody coming to your house and being able to do a, a prick to test your child would really, really help us to improve the detection of HIV early in children. Um, okay. Antenatal booking. So, again, we know that in order to um, prevent mother-to-child transmission, women who are HIV positive need to be on treatment as early as preferably 14 weeks of pregnancy. But in South Africa, half of women book for their first time after their 20th week. So we are losing a number of women who could have been started on treatment earlier. Now, um, if community health workers, like they do in Bangladesh and India, were able to carry um, urine dipstick pregnancy tests, they would be able to talk to a woman about whether she might be pregnant, do a dipstick, and encourage her and motivate her to go and book early in her pregnancy. So these are all simple tasks that somebody um, who knows their community well um, and had a trusting and respectful relationship may be able to make a difference. Um, so currently in South Africa, we have a process underway um, called primary healthcare reengineering, and it's um, a process to make some shifts in the way our primary healthcare services are delivered. Um, we currently have around 65,000 community health workers across the country. Um, they're largely employed through CBOs and NGOs. I think that. At the moment, um, the Northwest and KwaZulu-Natal are the only two provinces that have brought their community health workers onto the Purcell system with um, government uh, contracts and, and um, salaries. Um, they're, they're in the process of establishing these ward-based outreach teams, which are supposed to consist of a group of community health workers with a professional nurse supervising them. And at the same time, there's a a level being developed called the district specialist team where there should be a um, pediatrician, an obstetrician, an advanced midwife, a pediatric nurse and a primary health care trained nurse. Um, so these are supposed to be helping to guide the um, primary health care services for a district. But there's currently different stages of scale up across the country um, and different provinces are having different models of care. So KwaZulu-Natal is a unique... Is anybody from KZN here? No. They have something called Project Sakuma Sake, which is a different approach to um, community health workers. Um, despite a, a, a government, a national framework that was developed on community health workers, we have different provinces 
offering different salaries and stipends. Um, anecdotal evidence that we're getting is that the salaries are not regular, that several months go by and they don't get paid and then they do get paid. And so there are challenges currently. So this is um, where the um, outreach team sits with the five to six community health workers and one professional nurse, and they provide the community-based health services, including household-level services, school health, environmental health, mobilization and health promotion. They then report to a PHC clinic, and the district support, uh, the specialist teams then um, oversee the services. Okay. But currently in South Africa, the role of community health workers is focused on prevention and promotion. Um, our scope of practice does not allow for any curative services at the moment, and it's, it's around um, advising uh, families on what services they should um, go in and receive. So um, for, for promotion activities, um, currently, they're not able to do pregnancy testing or HIV testing. Uh, they promote safe um, sexual behavior and exclusive breastfeeding and complementary feeding. Uh, water sanitation and hygiene, they're supposed to promote safe water supply, healthy home environments, personal hygiene, food hygiene, and um, solid and liquid waste disposal. Um, for disease prevention, they cannot provide vitamin A supplementation. They don't provide um, mebendazole for deworming. They promote immunizations and family planning, and they are able to carry condoms. Um, and they don't provide any um, treatment for, for case management, but they do offer adherence support for ARVs, TB, and chronic diseases. Okay. So... If we look at what would be required to um, add to the roles and functions of community health workers in South Africa, well, currently there wouldn't be any legislative barrier to them providing oral rehydration solution and zinc or pregnancy testing and HIV testing because these are um, non um, these these are non prescription items. Um, vitamin A is classified as a medicine, but it's not required a, a prescription and neither is mebendazole. So it's really the antibiotics which would be harder to put into um, policy here, although currently in KwaZulu-Natal there is a study which is investigating, um, is allowing a group of community health workers to treat, and um, hopefully we will see the results of that soon. Okay, so the last two or three slides. Um, what do we need in order to establish um, a district-based um, out outreach team, um, which is the current model? Um, well, we need strengthened district management and coordination structures. Um, ideally, there, there should be a community health committee that's functioning so that there is a link uh, and a... Um, a group that is um, also advocating and supporting uh, community health workers um, and can help generate demand. Um, that's a really critical at, at the start of a program that com community members know firstly that the services are available and that they're um, willing to use them. So demand is an important aspect. Um, important to do a community assessment um, to review what services are available, what the, the greatest challenges are in communities so that the services can be tailored to the needs of a community because a rural area might have very different requirements of a community health worker to a peri-urban area. So it's important to do um, community needs assessment at the start. You need to identify the gaps in service provision and, um, and to see what then what should CHWs focus on? Okay. Um, somebody mentioned the importance of defining the role so that it's clear to everybody, so that the expectations are met. Um, so that somebody doesn't think that a community health worker is going to perhaps come and provide home-based care to their household member every single day, um, but they will come and, and provide support 
perhaps on a weekly basis or whatever is reasonable um, for their catchment area. Um, the district operational plans need to be developed with community consultation so that they're aware and, um, again, have um, appropriate expectations. Um, and then documenting and disseminating good practices. I think that um, there are pockets of South Africa where we have had uh, good experiences with community health worker programs, um, particularly in areas like Klebisa um, and, and around the Africa Centre, um, and in the Western Cape, we have a long history of using community health workers. So um, the good practices need to be documented so that we can learn from them. That is a community health worker in Mozambique. So before we move on to the video, we do have five minutes. Um, if any of you are interested in looking at the reports from the six country study, um, they're available on the MRC website. And there's a report for each country, um, as well as a cross-cutting report with the findings um, comparing across the six countries. Um, yeah, are there any questions or comments before we move on to the video? Yeah.